Hello again, everyone. Welcome to a bonus uh, um, episode of uh, Ultima 7, where I read the Book of Fellowship, as written by Batlin of Britain, who is totally not evil. 1. Salutations to the Traveler. Good morning to thee, gentle friend and traveler. And no, this is not necessarily the voice that I'm going to do for him. I don't know what voice I'm going to do for him yet. No matter what time of day it might be when thou art reading this, no matter what the hour of the clock, I say good morning to thee, because like the the player of this game, I work at night. So it is always morning when I wake up. I mean, <clears throat> sorry. I say good morning to thee, because this is this very moment brings to thee the coming of the dawn. The dawn, as everyone knows, is the moment when illumination comes. The dawn marks the end of the long night, long dark night, and a new beginning. It is my humble hope that these words may be for thee a dawning, or at least a type of awakening. I call thee traveler, no matter if thou hast never left thine own thy hometown, no matter if thou wilt never again leave thy room, because all of us are travelers. Deep, man, deep. I call thee traveler, for truly all of us travel a spiritual or philosophical, philosophical path, even if it is simply by living the life that we choose to live, or by searching for a new life when our current one fails to satisfy our needs as thinking spiritual beings. It is past time I introduce myself to thee, gentle friend and traveler. My name is Batlin, and indeed I have been following this quest all my life. It has been a long road, but the rewards have been beyond measure. If thou wouldst permit me, I would very much wish appreciate... I would very much wish appreciate sharing these w rewards with you. Huh. Okay. Two, the story of Batman, part the first. There is much that I have set out to tell thee in this book. Some small part of it involves my own personal story. As that is the least important part of this book, I shall quickly relate my tale first, gentle friend and traveler. In that way, we shall soon have it over with. So, uh, we shall soon have it over with, and then be free to pass on to more important concerns. I was born in the forests surrounding the city of Yu and educated by the traditions of the Druids. Having been raised in the City of Justice, I was taught to always strive for fairness in dealing with others, and these teachings left a lasting impression upon me. But I'm totally not evil. See, this proves it. But while I found trees, birds, and moons to be very beautiful, I determined to dedicate my life to, s to the service of the people. So it was I left to seek my fortune in the world. This was a time when, over Lord British's objections, unruly lords waged war against each other, so there was little else to do but become a fighter in the city of Jellum. I regret killing, although much of what I did helped bring peace to our land once more. I learned well how to defend myself and to find the courage one must have to survive in battle. I also learned respect for those of valor who earn their wage by combat. Eventually those little wars ended and I found myself penniless and without a trade in the capital city of Britain. I became a bard simply because a bard was needed at the Blue Boar. There were none about, and I had the loudest voice. It was terrible, but you know, hey, what are you going to do? I found it interesting that he just became a bard, because a bard was what was needed. little uh, self-aggrandizing much there, Batlin? Never had I considered myself to be musically inclined, but it was a fair alternative to starvation. My voice was painful. Yeah, see, he said that. My mandolin strings would break rather than let me stroke them. After much heckling and many a thrown bottle, my talents did slowly develop. As the years passed, I began to feel the deep compassion the bar that bards know when singing of heroic deeds. I discovered that sharing a spiritual rapper with my audience was very moving. Several of my ballads are still sung today, although, by tradition, the player will no doubt take credit for composing them himself. Think about that for a moment. While in Britain, I met two remarkable individuals. They were twins, Elizabeth and Abraham. Uh, I, will, I often shorten them to E and A. They were also well-versed students of philosophy, and many were the hours we spent in discussion and debate. We did raise our voices on occasion, gentle friend and traveler, but that did not prevent uh, us from becoming fast friends. 
Although I would never presume to intrude upon their privacy by revealing the many fascinating details I learned about them and their lives, I will say that they play a truly significant role in the part of this book that is my story. A mage from Moonglow who had heard me perform came to offer me employment as his, assi as his assistant. Magic has always fascinated me, and so I became his apprentice. I will always remember his teaching that if I was so successfully... His teaching that... It if I was so successfully commune with the invisible world without lapsing into madness, I must ever retain my honesty. If one is to live outside the laws of reality, one must first be honest. He taught me well. It was with great sadness that I ended my studies in the magical arts when my master, who was most elderly, passed away. While drinking at the Blue Boar soon after his passing, Elizabeth, Abraham, and I each decided that we needed something to which to dedicate our lives. On a youthful whim, we made a pact that we would go our separate ways and spend the next decade traveling throughout the land to find adventure, and to find ourselves as well. We agreed to reunite at the Blue Boar in exactly ten years. Our departure was exciting yet melancholy, as my life began, began a new chapter. 3. The Old Man and the Bandits On the road leading out of Britain I met a man bent with age, but still possessed of keen wit. As we walked he shared with me his tale, and I in turn shall share it with thee. During a stroll through the woods one day, this man was kidnapped by a group of vicious bandits. The poor man had just left his nephew's family and had no one else in the world. Woe to them who have been kidnapped <clears throat> when they have no one to pay their ransoms. Yes, I am reading a physical copy, by the way, if you can hear the page is turning. The bandits soon began to loathe their captive and did make plans to kill him. One wanted to hang him, while another wanted to stab him. Still another wanted to burn him at the stake, while yet a fourth wanted to tie rocks about his waist and throw him in the river. Seems awfully contrived, doesn't it? So angry did the, they wax in their disagreement over what manner of violence to use that they did break into an awful bloody row. And so it was that this old man did escape from the bandits, who were distracted with their brawling. And no, this has nothing at all to do with the hobbit. Upon noticing their victim was gone, they continued to fight, this time over whose fault it had been, until all of them lay dead, murdered by each other's hand. It's kind of strange, you'd think that one of them would survive the end, but uh, apparently not. This old man was later reunited with his nephew's family, and all were joyous of it. For as he had learned, unity is essential for survival, and unlike those reckless bandits, he still wished to live for a good many years yet. Unity, you say, huh? For the story of Batlin, part to the second. My travels took me to Trinzic, and there I encountered a group of men at arms with whom I became most impressed. Many fighters I have known were men of valorous heart on the battlefield, but off it little more than thugs. These men were not mere fighters, but paladins. But not that most famous of paladins, Dupre, of course. That would be, uh, uh, just silly. They were, well, they were all skilled swordsmen and expert horsemen, as well as learned scholars and perfectly mannered gentlemen. Above all, they were devoted to the preservation of honor. It was with eager gratitude that I accepted their invitation to join them. The following years were filled with excitement as we journeyed throughout the land, righting wrongs and helping those in need. During one of our adventures, I was injured and forced to remain in Minnock while my companions rode on. A healer there told me that without the proper treatments, for which he charged outrageous prices, I would most certainly die. Uh, most probably die, I should say. I angrily sent him away. After a time, I did mend. I had learned that the healing process takes place mostly in one's mind, and have since placed no trust in healers who greedily prey upon the afflicted. After all, what's a little missing limb? You can just think it back. At that time, the town of Minnock was in need of a tinker. As I healed, I supported myself by fixing, building, and inventing things. I had never before realized how much a town is reliant upon its tinker nor how appreciative the local townspeople are to those who sacrifice themselves to continuously solving the problems of others. So welcome did they make me feel that I stayed for several years. Then, filled with the urge to roam and longing for the outdoors once more, I joined a band of rangers in Spiritwood. Rangers are a deeply spiritual people. Living with them reminded me very much of my druid childhood in you, with one big difference. These, drew these rangers drank the most wonderful wine I have ever tasted. The bottles came from the old winery at Scarabray, having survived the terrible fires which ravaged that island. Fires that ravaged that island? Hmm, we're going to have to 
figure out more about that. Later, I made a pilgrimage to the desolate ruins of Scarbray, and there I had a spiritual experience so profound that I have vowed never to relate it to anyone. Leaving their band, I gave away all my possessions, and for months I wandered aimlessly. Eventually, I arrived at Numagentia, although how I won't tell you because it involved me, uh, um, stealing a boat, where I sought employment as a shepherd. Most of the following two years was spent in perfect solitude, living in complete humility. I was an exper it was an experience that left me significantly changed. When I noticed that ten years had almost passed, I began the journey back to Britain. 5. The Two Brothers and the Trickster On the road back to Britain, I noticed a small mine being worked by two brothers. They greeted me suspiciously, but eventually shared with me their tale, and I shall share it with thee. Their father died and left them a map to some unclaimed claimed land that contained valuable minerals. By law, a claim can only be made in one name, and this led the brothers into conflict. One brother was the eldest, the other was more worldly. Both wanted the claim. They became so fearful that the other would take would make the claim that each spent all of his time spying on the other. No work was done. One day they met a stranger who said he was a mining engineer. They did not trust him at first, but he assured them that their claim was too small to be of interest. He was on the way to stake a much larger claim. The stranger turned their heads with tales of the riches they could have, replacing their distrust with avarice. The brothers asked the stranger to make their claim for them, and went back to working their mine. They worked without stopping for months, and afterward traveled to the mint to sell their ore. At the mint, they learned the stranger had staked their claim in his own name, and then sold it outright for a fortune. As the brothers had taken ore from land they did not own, they were sent to the prison in Yew for many years. Their sad fate taught them to be more trusting of each other, for a man who does not trust his brother is always vulnerable. After hearing their tale, I went to the, to the mint, for I was curious which of the two brothers held the claim to the new, their new mine. I had tried to guess, but was quite surprised when I saw the answer. It was in the name of their father. <clears throat> 6. The Creation of the Fellowship I was overjoyed when Elizabeth and Abraham both arrived at the Blue Boar, safe and sound. It was a splendid reunion. The tales they told me were truly astounding, gentle friend and traveler. But as I have mentioned, I do not wish this tome to be an intrusion upon their privacy. Not all of their our memories were pleasant ones. Most of the people in Britannia, it seemed, were more interested in helping themselves than in helping their fellow person. As travelers, strangers, wherever we went, we had become use, used to the cold eye of suspicion upon us. Everywhere there were people who expected something for nothing, as if owed a debt by the world. Most of all, each of us had met many people who were fundamentally unhappy. Everywhere there were people who knew that they needed something in their lives, gentle friend and traveler, but that they had they had not a hope of finding it. And yet you were just talking about how welcome you were made in so many towns. The three of us had learned much of history. There was once a time when life was infinitely more fragile, but was cherished much more dearly. We yearned to recapture that aspect of Britannia's former glory. After much discussion, we decided to found a society called the Fellowship. At this time, I was also conceiving what would become its philosophy, but that will be discussed further in another chapter. It was Abraham who, dis who suggested that I propose the Fellowship to Lord British. I agreed, little realizing the task I was undertaking. Part 7. The Ratification of Wise Lord British It was with much an anxiety that I stood before the throne of wise Lord British. I was in a long line of subjects as our liege made numerous pronouncements. Although I had been waiting for hours when I, had, when I at last had my audience, I still felt unprepared. His unwavering glance fell upon me. I said that I had a modest proposal. My colleagues and I sought to establish a philosophical society known as the Fellowship. Lord British asked me who would see the benefits of this fellowship. I rep replied that no one would benefit from it, for it would not be run for profit. With a word I was dismissed. I found myself leaving the throne room before it had even sunk in that I had been refused. By the look on my face, Elizabeth and Abraham knew I, had, I was not the bearer of good news. In discussing the matter, Elizabeth suggested that Lord British had desired a tribute from us. If we could present an impressive enough tribute, he would grant his favor. 
After a time, we raised a thousand gold pieces by selling nearly every possession we owned. With renewed confidence, I returned to the castle. This time there were several workmen with me to carry the chests of gold that were our tribute. As I reached the front of the line, I spoke boldly. I said that I wished to discuss the fellowship, but first wished to present Lord British with suitable tribute. With consternation, I realized that I had spoken before Lord British had finished reading an important-looking scroll placed before him by one of his advisors. He signed it as he spoke, not even bothering to look up at me. First he ordered my workmen to remove the boxes. Then he ordered the workmen to remove me as well. Angrily, I stormed from the throne room. Once more did I face my two friends. We, we were most disappointed. The dream we shared now seemed to have no hope of becoming reality. I spent days somberly brooding over my failure. One morning found me so completely lost in my thoughts that I did not hear the passing beggar approach. When at last I noticed him, he spoke, a coin for one denied the rewards of worthiness. The illumination was pure and instantaneous. He thought I had gone mad when I gave him my chest of gold. I ran back to the palace as fast as I could. At first, Lord British would not see me, but I implored him. He looked me over and seemed to see something different about me. He listened as I spoke. Our society, the Fellowship, will be a union of spiritual seekers that shall strive to bring unity to our fractured society. We will, promise, we will promote trust and understanding among all the people of Britannia. With your approval, our society will teach one to seek worthiness rather than mere personal reward. To that end, I seek your recognition of the Fellowship. After a long moment, Lord British replied, Batlin, thou dost know the meaning of perseverance. I cannot for what thy Fellowship I care not for what thy fellowship dost wish of me, and I care even less for what thy fellowship would seek to do for me. But if thy fellowship would seek to serve the subjects of my land, then my support for thee is unequivocal. Thus was born the fellowship. 8. The Value of Virtues and the Virtue of Values In creating the fellowship philosophy, I had no intention of cobbling together a collection of platitudes that would be presumptuously intended as a replacement of the eight virtues of the Avatar. I knew there would be those who would accuse me of doing just that, no matter what philosophy I developed. I hereby wish to state that the Fellowship fully supports the eight virtues of the Avatar, and as one who has endeavored to follow their example, I can personally assure thee of their immeasurable worth. But as one who has followed the eight virtues, I know whereof I speak when I say that it is impossible to perfectly live up to them. Even the Avatar was unable to do so continuously and consistently. Uh, hey, hey, I resent that. It's all Iolo doing the stealing. Don't look back on uh, um, Ultima 4, please. <laughs> can anyone say that they have been honest every moment of every day of their lives? Yes, the Avatar can. Can anyone say that they are always compassionate, valorous, just, sacrificing, honorable, humble, or spiritual at all times? Yes, the Avatar can! The philosophy of the Eight Virtues does little more than emphasize our own personal deficiencies. I have met many adherents to the ways of the virtues, who are wrecked with guilt over what they perceive to be their spiritual failures, for that is what the virtues are based upon. Having been shown our weaknesses, now is the time to strengthen them. The philosophy of the fellowship has been created to eradicate the failures from one's life. It is a philosophy based upon the success, and it enhances everything that has come before it. The fellowship philosophy can be expressed as three values derived from the personal experiences of my life. They are known as the Triad of Inner Strength. 9. The Triad of Inner Strength The Triad of Inner Strength is a rigorous mental discipline. It takes concentrated effort to apply this triad of values to thy life. But in doing so, thou, sh thou will see a change in thy life so significant that thou shalt no longer be able to look in the world in the same way again. The first value of the Triad of Inner Strength is expressed as Strive for Unity. <clears throat> People apply this value to their lives by working together to achieve that which shall benefit everyone on, in a state of mutual cooperation. We have seen by the parable of the old man and the bandits how unity is essential. If we are not working together, then we are certainly working against each other. The second value of the triad of inner strength is expressed as trust thy brother. People apply this value to their lives by dealing with others without accusations, or suspicions that limit others and themselves. We have seen by the parable of the two brothers and the trickster just how vulnerable lack of trust makes one. Without trust, we restrict ourselves from that which we wish to accomplish. The third value of the triad of inner strength is expressed as worthiness precedes reward. 
People apply this value in their lives by placing a great emphasis on their accomplishments rather than on personal gain. We have seen by the parable of the ratification of wise Lord British that one must not expect something for nothing. Blindly chasing reward is a path which leads nowhere. 10. The Philosophy of the Fellowship The scholarly name of the fellowship philosophy, which I did not personally coin, is Sanguine Cognition. This is merely an important-sounding way of saying, saying cheerful knowledge. And that is as accurate a description of the fellowship philosophy as I can imagine. As long as one maintains his confidence in the hopefulness and hopefulness, one is continuously open to the opportunities that perpetually exist in life. I firmly believe that, gentle reader and traveler, that thou shouldst believe in it as well. Without confidence, one does not perceive the world correctly, and hence one misses opportunities. This sad state of fevered reason currently holds the majority of the population in its icy grip. Such fevered persons begin to adapt illusory notions to their thinking and entangle themselves in twisted, conflicting emotions which reinforce their failures. These sad people become afraid of themselves. They begin to believe that they will fail, and this belief can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Such a fevered person, whether he realizes it or not, desperately needs to recognize that the world is not a tangled knot of failure. The entire process of thought needs to be permanently fixed in to a confident nature. Such a person needs to find the best in himself and accept his basic worth. This is rarely an easy task. It requires a reflection upon oneself that can be emotionally painful. But as we say in the fellowship, sometimes one must face harm in order to find healing. Upon achieving recognition, one will follow his own inner voice of reason that will guide him th through life and help him avoid failure. One of the most difficult things to accept is how reliant we are upon others. We fear the rejection, the real or imagined hidden motives, and the potential deceit of others. Accepting our inevitable reliance upon others is an integral part of our role in this world. In, in, accepting our in, inevitable reliance upon others as an integral part of our role in this world requires the courage to walk on fire. To achieve the recognition necessary to break free of the fever, one must dedicate every fiber of being to accomplishing that end. We of the Fellowship travel that path, and I extend my invitation, invitation to thee, gentle friend and traveler, to join us. Together we shall reach our destination. <clears throat> the next section of the book is a reinterpretation of the history of Britannia, being in part a collection of historical facts, with a modern interpretation thereof supplied by the author, Batlin of Britain. Going on longer than I expect, actually. <clears throat> 1. Ancient Sosaria. Long ago, before the formation of the Kingdom of Britannia, the land was known as Sosaria. It was little more than a multitude of warring city-states and feudal fiefdoms, and the people of the land suffered for it. It was wise Lord British, then ruler of the city-state of Britain, who eventually brought the land and the people of Sosaria together. 2. The Ages of Darkness. The Ages of Darkness are well named, for they, for they were a time when dark terrors walked the land. It may also be said that during the age of, Ages of Darkness, the peoples of Sosaria were the furthest from illumination, for this was truly a time when spiritual pursuits were at their ebb. 3. The Tale That Is Called The First Age of Darkness The beginning of the First Age of Darkness is marked by the coming of a sorcerer named Mondane, the father of Mondane had refused to share his secret of immortality with his son, and their disputes ultimately led to the father's death. Torn with anguish and no doubt by his fears of persecution, Mondane turned his dark powers against the kingdoms of Sosaria. In desperation, Lord British called forth a champion to rise to the defense of the realm. The hero who responded to this, his summons would many years later come to be known as the Avatar. It was through the actions of this avatar that Mundane's foul gem of power was shattered, and Mundane himself did come to a very sad end indeed. 4. The Tale That Is Called Revenge of the Enchantress The triumph of the avatar did not last long, for in slaying Mundane, he brought the wrath of Minax down upon the land. She! 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 Jeez, get it right, Batlin. Minox was the young lover of Mundane, and a sorceress with magical powers even greater than Mundane's. 
She had the power to command legions of foul creatures, and in her quest for vengeance over the death of her lover, she brought much misery to the people of Sosaria. Which, strangely enough, looked like Earth. Actually, I think it might have actually been Earth in that game. I don't know. I haven't really played those games much. Again, the hero who would come to be known as the Avatar returned to Brit Britannia in the first recorded use of the Moon Gates. The Avatar slew Minax's minions and did eventually destroy her as well. While there have been speculations as to the motivations of the Avatar, there is insufficient evidence to show that the Avatar was driven by violence, uh, driven to violence by jealousy over Mundane's romantic involvement with Minax. That being said, such theories are hereby denounced and should not be given consideration. But I am mentioning it here so it sticks in your mind. So that I can continue to uh, sully the reputation of the wonderful Avatar. 5. The tale that is called Exodus. No one in all of Susaria, not even the Avatar, could have realized that by ending the lives of Mundane and Minex, the Avatar would be orphaning their only child. The name of this unusual child was Exodus, and he was neither machine nor human. Exodus rose from the bottom of the great ocean to carry out a campaign of revenge and destruction against the land of Sosaria. So terrible were the forces unleashed by Exodus that the hero whom we would come to know as the Avatar required the assistance of a mysterious mm, excuse me, being known as the Time Lord, specifically Tom Baker, <clears throat> to thwart them. And thus it was that the Avatar did deal with Exodus in a similar manner as he dealt with his mother and father. Since that time, much speculation has been given to the potentially immeasurable good such a creature of, as Exodus could have brought the land had he been persuaded to become beneficial, bene, uh, beneficent. But I wish to formally disagree with those who say the Avatar should have handled the situation differently. But again, I'm mentioning it so that it sticks in your mind and I can sully the reputation of the Avatar. 6. The Rise of Britannia after the smiting of Exodus, the people of Sosaria, who lived in terror during the onslaught of those these evil magical beings, did unite together as a measure of self-protection under the sovereign rule of Lord British. Th thus was formed the Kingdom of Britannia. Led by wise Lord British, the land did come to flourish. The eight major townships rose upon the foundations of the old city-states. A renaissance of culture and civilization was highlighted by the formation of great institutions devoted to the study and advancements, advancement of the arts and sciences. 7. The tale that is called Quest of the Avatar It was at this time of growth and prosperity in the Kingdom of Britannia that Lord British put out a call for one to show the way of spiritual growth and virtue. The call was answered by the hero who had come to be known as the Avatar. Heroine. Jeez, Balin? Not only are you sullying my name, you're getting my gender wrong. It was at this time that the Champion of Britannia did come to earn the title of Avatar, by establishing the Eight Virtues and by seizing the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom from the, from the depths of the Stygian Abyss. It has been said that the primary motivation of the Avatar has been personal redemption for the fate of mundane Menax and Exodus, while there has been no proof of this, I say that even if it were true, all the positive things brought forth in the world through the virtues would be enough to make amends for almost any misdoing. Why would I want personal redemption for the fate of mundane Minax and Exodus when they were terrible evil beings bent on destruction and uh, enslavement? Just saying. 8. The tale that is called Warriors of Destiny. It seems that by removing the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom, the Avatar had inadvertently set into motion a cosmic chain of events which led to the release of three Shadow Lords from remnant shards of the Black Gem of Mundane. These Shadow Lords were sinister agents of evil. Soon they managed to dethrone Lord British and hold him prisoner in a foul dungeon. Denied his wisdom and compassion, the Kingdom of Britannia quickly grew oppressive and cruel. This was the Britannia that greeted the return of the Avatar. After a score of valiant struggles, Lord British was liberated, his throne regained, and the Shadow Lords banished from our world. However, Lord British's escape from the Underworld did cause a tremendously destructive series of earthquakes, as the vast network of subterranean caverns collapsed. Much of the gar gargoyle race did perish in that tragic cataclysm. 9. The tale that is called the False Prophet. Now, I will note that... Batlin did not smear my good name quite as much in that last bit. The tale that is called The False Prophet. 
After the tremors that shook Britannia subsided, gargoyles, inhabitants of the other side of the world, who now found their homeland virtually destroyed, began to appear on the Britannian side of the world in increasing numbers as aggressors. They launched vicious attacks against the human race, and many were they who lost their lives in defense of our realm. The gargoyles even attempted to assassinate the Avatar. They set a Moongate trap which lured the Avatar into their clutches. But the Avatar was rescued by his companions. So it was that Lord British did once again call upon his champion to set the world right. Ending this violent racial conflict was the greatest challenge that the Avatar had ever faced. At last it was revealed that the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom, which had been removed from the Underworld by the Avatar, was actually the property of the Gargoyles. Therefore, the Avatar placed the Codex into the Great Ethereal Void where it would be possessed by neither human nor gargoyle. Two lenses used to view the Codex were given to Lord British and gargoyle, King, gargoyle ruler King Draxanusum. As the cause of the conflict between the two races had been removed, it was hoped that the rift between the two would eventually be closed. Those who would say that this terrible and destructive war could have been prevented entirely had the Avatar not appropriated the Codex from its true owners are merely dissidents who are grossly misinformed. 10. The last 200 years. It has been two centuries since the Lava... The, the Lavatar? The Avatar last appeared in our good kingdom. Some have written that at last it is possible to interpret the tales of the Avatar as they should be with a proper historical perspective. Some argue that as time moves on, the truth of what actually occurred will fade even further away, and that we have a responsibility to preserve the legends as we now know them. However, most agree when it comes to a number of basic theories. While there are those who maintain that the stories of the Avatar are only myths, practically all credible scholars say that at least some elements of the Avatar's tales are historical fact. In reality, one need look no further than the Isle of the Avatar to see very persuasive evidence that the Avatar did indeed exist, at least as a person, if not as a spiritual being. Excuse me, speak for yourself. I'm an extremely spiritual being. Being in the Avatar proves that. It is most likely that there has been more than one Avatar. All of the writings insist that the Avatar who negotiated the peace between Britannia and the Gargoyles is the one and the same person who appeared to vanquish the Sorcerer Mondain those many years ago. While saying it is most unlikely, historians do not firmly deny the possibility of there having been only one Avatar. After all, our good sovereign monarch, wise Lord British, has himself displayed an amazing longevity. Whatever interpretation of history proves to be most accurate, it seems undeniable that the Avatar will not return to our fair kingdom. By all indications, the Age of Magic is coming to an end, with the decline in reliability of mages, and with the kingdom turning away from the magical arts. It is doubtful that extreme danger, that which would require an Avatar's aid to defeat it, will ever return to Britannia, and thankfully so. Upon us is the Age of the Fellowship, in which one does not simply wait in anticipation for a heroic savior when a crisis occurs. In this less spectacular but more practical day, we are left to solve our problems with our own minds and our own will. And remember, I am totally not evil. Alright, thank you for, uh... If you sat through all that, thank you for sitting through it. Luckily, since nothing was going on screen, you can minimize it or go to another tab or something like that and just listen to me ramble on. Um, I wanted to read that because it is, uh, pretty indicative of Batlin's character and, um... It definitely does give you some background on what's going on. I will pretty much pick up most of it throughout the game, but um, I did want to, uh, everyone to uh, get that, and I don't know that anyone else has read through that. So, anyway, thank you all for uh, listening if you did, and if you didn't, well, you're not hearing me say this, so... Screw you, I guess? No, I'm just kidding. Alright, see you guys.